So let me just say welcome. I'm Kim Brooks. I'm the dean here at the Shulman School of Law. It's a pleasure to have you in the building. As you may know, we have a series of mini law lectures, which are lectures on current issues of interest in the area of law, designed for people who may or may not have a legal background. So welcome to this one, and please join us for others if you find the format interesting. Um, you're in for a real treat tonight. Diana Ginn is one of the most spectacular teachers that we have in the school. She wins the teaching award. You know, like we have to have a rule for her that says she can't win it every year so that she can share it with others. And so she's, she's been the recipient of both of our teaching awards a number of times. She's very talented in the areas that you're going to hear her talk about tonight, religion and the law. But she's also talented in property law and administrative law. And she does some uh, alternative dispute resolution teaching and workshops as well. And so. Um, I'm sure she'll be interesting and engaging tonight on this topic that has been, if nothing else, controversial. And so, welcome. Thank you very much. Don't forget to get yourself a cup of coffee if you haven't had one, and please enjoy the evening. Thank you, Kim. Well, good evening and welcome, and thank you so much for coming out on a grey Wednesday evening. The issue of law and religion, that is the issue of how law should intersect, secular law should intersect with religion in a democratic, secular, multi-faith country such as Canada is, at least to me, endlessly interesting. And you can hardly open up the newspaper without finding some issue that relates to law and religion. So for instance, can somebody on the grounds of freedom of religion refuse to take the citizenship oath? Can a woman wearing a niqab take the citizenship oath? Should a complainant in a sexual assault trial be able to give evidence while wearing a niqab? Should a woman wearing a headscarf be heard in a Quebec courtroom at all? If the government decides that all driver's licenses require photographs and you have a religious group that believes that having their photograph taken violates the second commandment, does that mean they can't drive or is there something wrong with the legislation? Should a school board allow religious parents to take their children out of a mandatory ethics and religious culture class in school? Should marriage commissioners be able to opt out of performing same-sex marriages on religious grounds? Should a school board be able to use its ban on weapons in the schoolyard to prohibit a Sikh student from wearing his kirpan, his ceremonial dagger? Can a person refuse to file income tax returns because they have religious objections to some of the ways in which the tax dollars are spent? Does the criminal code ban on polygamy violate freedom of religion? And always my favorite, does a municipal bylaw which bans the keeping of farm animals inside of township boundaries, does that need to be amended to make room for the Amish who travel by horse and buggy? These are just a tiny number of the cases and the issues that arise around how law and religion should intersect. And as I say, you pick up the newspaper and you're going to find some issue that involves law and religion. And all these issues that I've raised are difficult because all of them involve trying to balance what the state is trying to achieve, you know, the driver's license, concerns about identity theft, for, for instance, trying to balance what the state is, wants to achieve while on the same hand, on the other hand, providing some protection for freedom of religion. But I would suggest that the kinds of issues that I want to talk about tonight are even more difficult because I want to talk about how should we go about responding when two constitutionally entrenched rights are in conflict. So now the state has to uh, balance one constitutional right or freedom against another. I am going to be specifically talking about the potential for collision between freedom of religion and equality rights, 
But I think the framework that I'm going to suggest to you could be relevant in the context of conflicts between other entrenched rights as well. And so what I want to ask today, or tonight, is when is it justifiable or reasonable for the state to infringe freedom of religion in order to uphold equality rights and then flip that on its head and ask when is it reasonable or justifiable for the state to infringe equality rights in order to uphold freedom of religion. First, you're going to get a three and a half minute uh, constitutional <coughs> law class. Some of you are going to be very familiar with what I talk about, others of you aren't. In 1982, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms became part of the Constitution of Canada. And as part of the Constitution of Canada, the Charter is directed at state action. The rights and freedoms set out in the Charter have a particular degree of protection against state action that infringes. So when I say that the Charter is directed or is, is, a, is a protection against certain kinds of state action, what do I mean by that? What am I talking about when I say state action? Well, first of all, as we all know, the state can act <coughs> through passing legislation, through passing a law. Okay. So in one of the examples that I gave earlier, the Alberta legislature passed a law that said anybody who wants to drive has got to have their photograph on their driver's license. Um, in that case, a group, the Hatterian Brethren, raised the argument that this violated their freedom of religion, and so they brought a case to court saying this legislation should be struck down because it violates our freedom of religion. They, they didn't win. Uh, so that's one form of state action, the, the state passing legislation. However, another very prevalent form of state action in today's world is that the state, the government, sets up boards and tribunals and commissions and, and agencies all these bodies we lump under the heading of administrative decision makers. And you're familiar with them. This is all the way from school boards to human rights tribunals to labor boards to occupational health and safety tribunals. The list goes on and on and on and on. So these administrative decision makers are set up to make decisions to carry out state policy. So for the, the example that I gave of the Sikh student who wanted to wear his kirpan on the schoolyard, he was not challenging a piece of legislation. He was using freedom of religion to challenge the policy of an administrative decision maker, in that case, the school board. And he won um, at the Supreme Court of Canada. Similarly, in the case that we're going to be looking at a little bit later, in the Trinity Western case, it is the decision of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society, an administrative body in that context, uh, that was being challenged. So the state can act through, uh, and the Charter applies, to legislation. The Charter applies to administrative decision makers, such as boards and tribunals. You also see freedom of religion and other uh, constitutional arguments coming up in other charter arguments coming up in the, in the context of other litigation where the court is asked to make a ruling. So for instance, you know, where the court has to make a ruling in the context of a sexual assault trial as to whether or not the complainant can wear a niqab covering her face when she gives evidence. In this talk, I'm going to focus on uh, the state action through legislation and through those boards and tribunals, those administrative decision makers. So, um, I have said that the Charter can be used to challenge the actions of the state where those actions allegedly violate the rights and freedoms entrenched in the Charter, but none of the rights and freedoms in the Charter are 
absolute. And that, of course, leads to the kind of issues that we're going to talk about um, in a minute. If legislation is challenged as infringing a charter right, the legislation can still be upheld if the court is persuaded that the infringement is justifiable in a free and democratic society. Um, and this comes from section one, the very first section of the charter. Before we get to enumerating all the rights and freedoms, we have this section that says, in effect, these rights and freedoms have got all kinds of protection, but they're not absolute. So the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it, subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So when legislation is being challenged as violating a charter right, section one tends to get a lot of play. However, I also gave the example of a board, a tribunal, an administrative decision maker whose decision is being challenged as not taking sufficient account of charter rights. And in that case, the courts, the test ends up, I would suggest, being somewhat, in fact, very similar, but worded a little bit differently. Um, there, the issue is going to be, in most cases, um, did the administrative decision maker act reasonably? And one way of asking if they acted reasonably is to say, did that board, that tribunal, that committee, that whatever, reasonably balance the charter right or rights in question with the purpose of the legislation that gives it its powers? Okay. So thus far I've said that no charter or right, right or freedom is absolute and that sometimes a restriction will be allowed, an infringement will be allowed because it's found to uh, fit the test under section one or it's found to be reasonable. But that doesn't mean that charter rights are, are irrelevant or so watered down that we don't need to pay any attention to them. I would suggest that the rights and freedoms in the charter do put some breaks on government action and apply the break to government action. The state cannot, because of the charter, the state cannot simply restrict minority rights cannot simply restrict the rights of unpopular groups just because it has a political majority, just because it would be politically expedient to do so. So I've already introduced you to section one of the charter. There's two other sections that I want to tell you about before I really get into the heart of my talk. The first, so you have section one, which we just looked at. Section two of the charter goes on and says that everyone has certain fundamental freedoms. And among those fundamental freedoms, and in fact the very first one that is listed, this is the first right that occurs in the Charter, is the right to freedom of conscience and religion. This is also the section that talks about um, freedom of, of expression and, and freedom of association and so on, but I want to focus on freedom of religion. So what does freedom of religion mean? Well, as you can well imagine, there's been a lot written about that. I am just going to give you one quote, one quote from the very first case, a 1985 case, the very first time that the Supreme Court of Canada had to turn its mind to what freedom of religion means under the Charter. So for the law school types, this is the Big M Drug Mart case. This is what the court had to say, a truly free society is one that can accommodate a wide variety of beliefs, diversity of tastes and pursuits, customs and codes of conduct. A free society is one which aims at equality with respect to the enjoyment of fundamental freedoms, and of course this is a fundamental freedom. Freedom must surely be founded in respect for the inherent dignity and the inviolable rights of the human person. The essence of the concept of freedom of religion is the right to entertain such religious beliefs as a person chooses, the right to declare religious beliefs openly and without fear of hindrance or reprisal, and the right to manifest religious belief by worship and practice or by teaching and dissemination. So that's one section I want you to hold in mind, 2A. I also want you to think about section 15 of the Charter, the equality rights provision of the Charter 
which tells us that every individual is equal before and under the law and has the right to the equal protection and the equal benefit of the law without discrimination. And in particular, without discrimination on a, a list of grounds are given here, race, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, sex, age, or mental or physical disability. In a case after the Charter became part of our, our uh, Constitution, the Supreme Court of Canada read in sexual orientation as an analogous ground. Because you'll see the wording doesn't say, and only on these grounds, it says an in particular. So that leaves room for the court to read in other grounds that then have the same protection as those listed here in section 15. So read this as though it also said, and sexual orientation, okay? So my question for this evening is, what happens? What happens when Section 2A and Section 15.1 of the Charter conflict? When should one person or one group's charter rights trump those of another person or group? How do we work that out? What principles do we apply? How do we find a just balance? And so all that is background for going back to the questions that I asked earlier. When is it justifiable or reasonable for the state, because again we're talking about state action here, for the state to limit one of these charter rights in order to protect the other? And as I said, I'm going to be looking at this question in the context of a particular dispute, that dispute regarding the proposed, not yet built, not yet there, but the proposed law school at Trinity Western University, which I'll probably colloquially refer to as TWU in the interest of time. Um, but I also hope that you will take away from this principles that are relevant in contemplating other issues and other kinds of conflict. So let me give you just a little bit of background then, for anyone who hasn't been following the controversy, just a little bit of background about Trinity Western. So Trinity Western University, which is located in Langley, British Columbia, is a private and privately funded university. It was founded as a college in 1962 by the Evangelical Free Church of America and became a degree-granting uh, university in 1979. It offers a wide range of undergraduate courses and has since then added on to professional programs, nursing and education. Its curriculum and teaching reflect, very purposely reflect, an evangelical Christian outlook. While students, not, neither students nor faculty are required to make any profession of faith in order to be able to teach there or go there, um, they are required to sign a community covenant. And the community covenant starts by stating the university's mission, core values, curriculum and community life are formed by a firm commitment to the person and work of Jesus Christ as declared in the Bible. It then becomes more specific. There is a, I've shortened it here, but there's a whole list of things that the community covenant, the signers of the community covenant say we're signing on to do, to be loving and good and compassionate and those things. And then it says, and by signing this uh, covenant, here are the things that we are going to not do. And that's where uh, things have become contentious. So those who sign the covenant, i.e. Uh, faculty and students of TWU, agree to avoid behaving in certain ways and particularly to abstain from destructive communication, harassment, dishonesty, theft, sexual intimacy that violates the sacredness of marriage between a man and a woman, that'll be the one we're coming back to, uh, the use of pornography, drunkenness, uh, the use of alcohol or tobacco on campus or at TWU-sponsored events. And I would note that this is not that different from codes of conduct that are assigned at a number of American law schools which are recognized by the American Bar Asso um, Association. So some years ago, TWU decided that it wanted to open a law school. So they consulted with various judges and lawyers and legal academics and so on, and after all that, put a proposal for a law school before this body that's called the Federation of Canadian Law Societies. So let me give you a wee bit of background there. 
Law is what we call a self-regulating profession. That means that the profession, that in each province or territory there is a body, sometimes called a law society, sometimes called a barrister society, that regulates the profession. And that regulates this. One of the key elements of self-regulation is that one regulates in the public interest. So Nova Scotia, the Nova Scotia Barrister Society, our law society here, is given power under the Legal Profession Act to regulate the practice of law in Nova Scotia. And one aspect of regulating the practice of law is regulating who can become a lawyer. So what counts as a law degree? What are your requirements for articling? Very, very articling means sort of the law version of apprenticing. Those things. However, provincial and territorial law societies across Canada had delegated to this sort of umbrella body, the Federation of Law Societies, the authority to determine what would count as a law degree, as a professional law degree that then would make one eligible to, to article. Okay? Um, and so that is why when TWU came up with its idea that it would like to create a law school and did some research and so on, when it got ready to have a proposal, that's why it put its proposal before the Federation of Law Societies, in effect saying, please check off that our students would count as having a law degree which would be um, sufficient to allow them to article um, in, in, in Canada, in the various provinces. So the, the Federation set up a special advisory um, committee which did research and talked to various people and so on and so on. And ultimately, the special advisory committee came to the conclusion that there is no public interest reason for refusing to recognize a law degree from Trinity Western. Um, and so after that, the proposed law school did receive um, approval from the Federation. However, um, throughout 2014, this became a very hotly debated topic among almost all the law uh, societies across Canada. A number decided they would accept uh, TWU grads, should there ever be TWU grads, this is still just a proposed school, but if there ever were TWU grads, a number of the, of the law societies said yes, you could come an article um, in our province, however a number said no, you couldn't, and Nova Scotia was one of the latter. In April of 2014, the Nova Scotia Barrister Society, which regulates the profession here, passed a resolution um, stating that because in their view the provision in the community covenant regarding no sexual intimacy except within the sacredness of a marriage between a man and a woman, that that was discriminatory and therefore graduates of TWU would not be permitted to article in Nova Scotia unless one of two things happened. Unless TWU allowed students to opt out of signing it, the covenant, or unless TWU um, amended the community covenant to take out that phrase that was seen as discriminatory. Trinity Western sought what we call judicial review, which is exactly what it sounds like. They went to court and asked a judge to review the decision of the Nova Scotia Barristers Society. In other words, they went to court to argue that the Nova Scotia Barristers Society had acted unreasonably, had not taken sufficient account, because remember the Barrister Society is, has to uh, take account of, of the Charter, had not taken sufficient account of freedom of religion in passing its resolution. In late January of this year, so very recently, Justice Jamie S. Campbell of the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia quashed, struck down, the decision of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society saying that the Nova Scotia Barrister Society did not have the authority to do what it had done, that the Nova Scotia Barrister Society was authorized to regulate the profession of law, but was not authorized to regulate 
law schools. And that, in fact, was what this resolution was attempting to do. So he started out by saying, you're doing something you don't have the authority to do. But then went on, and it's really this latter part that I want to focus on, and said, but even if you did, even if we were willing to assume that you had the authority to do what you were doing, you still have to take reasonable account of the charter rights at play, and you did not take reasonable account of freedom of religion. So, was this an appropriate outcome? Obviously, a hotly debated topic. I'm strongly committed to equality rights. I was in third year law school when the Charter came in. I was delighted to see protection for equality rights in the Charter. It mattered. And since the advent of the Charter, it is now more difficult for the state to discriminate on the basis of gender, race, disability, and so on, and since the Supreme Court of Canada read in sexual orientation on that ground as well. And we have seen enormous and much needed strides in removing discrimination against the LGBT community. These are all good things. Further, the church that I belong to, the United Church of Canada, was one of the first, if not the first, to allow for the ordination of openly gay and lesbian ministers. And in 2005, when same-sex marriage was being deb de debated in Parliament, the then moderator of the United Church wrote an open letter to every member of Parliament providing not just political, but th theological, religious reasons why same-sex marriage should be made the law. Therefore, the religious tradition to which I belong does not take the same view of marriage as it is exemplified in the Trinity Western Co Community Covenant. That said, the more I have thought about these issues, the more I have thought about what needs to be balanced on each side of the scale, the more convinced I have become that the Nova Scotia Barrister Society and other barrister societies who would wish to keep out TWU students were wrong, were unreasonable, and that Justice Campbell was absolutely right on the, hit the nail on the head when he said that the decision of the Barrister Society did not take sufficient account of freedom of religion. In my view, Justice Campbell's decision is lucidly reasoned, it engages in a careful balancing of rights, and it shows a clear understanding of what freedom of religion entails in Canada today. I want to tell you now a little bit about what previous cases have said about how courts should go about balancing, or, or anybody should go about ba courts or barrister societies when they're deciding on these things. One of the principles that are to be applied when trying to balance two constitutionally protected rights that are in conflict with each other. So I'll tell you about the principles, and then I'll tell you about how they are applied by Justice Campbell in his decision. Okay? And I promise that I will leave plenty of time for discussion afterwards, so if you have questions and comments on the, any of this, I would be delighted to hear it. Okay, so what have we been told by the courts are the principles to apply when there is a conflict between two constitutionally protected rights? Well, first of all, the courts have said, Look closely and see if that really is the case. Is there really a, a conflict there? I'm oh, sorry, I'm behind. That's what he said. And there we are. Um, so, first of all, if a dispute is characterized as involving a clash between two constitutionally protected rights, the Supreme Court of Canada has said, take a good hard look at it. See if that really is what's happening there. Maybe there really isn't a conflict. Um, perhaps a closer look will show that both rights are not in competition or that both can be protected or accommodated. And I would of course agree that where it is possible to have a mutual flourishing of rights and freedoms, that's the optimal outcome. Further, even if um, there are rights in conflict, maybe we can craft, maybe sometimes, 
we can craft responses that share the protections and burdens of the law. So that each gets some protection and some burden and neither side sort of really is elevated over the other. Those situations are wonderful. However, I want us to turn our mind to the much more difficult question of what do we do when there really is a conflict? When the only way of resolving that issue is to say your constitutional rights are going to get more protection and in order for that to happen, your constitutional rights are going to have to get slightly less protection. Okay? Um, and I would suggest that although it's grand that the Supreme Court of Canada says, take a good look, see if there really is a problem here. Maybe there won't be a conflict. Dandy idea. However, I would suggest to you that if there truly is a conflict, it does not benefit anybody to try to pretend it's not there, to try to mask the reality of that conflict. If a particular freedom is engaged, let's say so. Let's say so and let's deal with that head on. And so, uh, interestingly, the Nova Scotia Barrister Society argued that freedom of religion was not actually engaged, was not actually affected by their resolution. Um, Justice Campbell said, no, you're wrong. Um, he noted that while for many Canadians today, studying the law is a secular pursuit. But this is not so for evangelical Christians whose, quote, religious faith governs every aspect of their lives. So in, in Justice Campbell's view, attending a Christian law school is therefore an expression of faith and an important aspect of their religious identity. He went on to say, the mandatory covenant is part of what makes TWU a distinctly evangelical Christian institution. It's easy for outsiders to point out aspects of faith and practices of faith that don't seem that important, but we don't get to make that call. Now, I'll just stop for a minute and tell you a little side story. Um, a year or two ago, I happened to be in um, Kingston, Ontario, so I went back to visit Queen's Law School, where I got my degree from, and was having a lovely wee chat with a very nice dean at Queen's. And somehow or other, I don't know how, we got talking about TWU. Um, and I said, and, and he was, uh, really in support of what the Nova Scotia Barrister Society ultimately did in saying, no, students from there shouldn't be able to article. And I said, in, in saying that, you know, what weight have you given to freedom of religion? And, uh, you know, do you not think that that affects the freedom of religion of, of, the, um, of the individual? And he said, well, I really, really hope that if we put this pressure on TWU, they'll come to realize that their views on marriage aren't that central to their faith. <laughs> and I thought, not sure that is a winning argument, right? You can say, I disagree with you. My faith tells me differently. I'd like to argue about the theological basis for your faith, but simply to announce, if you just thought a titch harder, you'd realize that this thing that you wrongly have thought was absolutely central to your faith isn't. Not a particularly winning argument. And it's that kind of argument that, you know, the response to that kind of argument that is encapsulated in Justice Campbell's statement, it is easy for outsiders to point out aspects of a faith and practices of faith that do not seem that important, but we don't get to make that call. He went on to say that trying to coerce evangelical Christians into disavowing beliefs that they sincerely hold is not a trivial infringement of freedom of religion. So, if freedom of religion is at stake here, we have to go on and ask, what do we do? How do we balance this conflict? More importantly, or very importantly, what principles do we apply in order to do so? Well, where constitutional rights um, are in conflict, the courts have said you've got to do the hard work of doing a case-by-case -case analysis as to what the outcome should be in this particular case. And how do we go about doing a case-by-case -case analysis? Well, the key principle that we keep in mind as the background to all the rest of our analysis is to remember that there is no hierarchy of constitutional rights, okay? 
the courts have said, and this is absolutely reflective of the language of the Charter, that no right or freedom in the Charter is more special, more entitled to protection than another right or freedom in the Charter. As between any two rights, if there is no hierarchy, that tells us that sometimes one right should win when there's a conflict, and sometimes the other right should win when there's a conflict. All the protections of the Charter, not just some, not just the socially popular, all the protections of the Charter are important bulwarks against the potentially coercive power of the state. And that is an incredibly important point to remember, that there is no hierarchy. And I would suggest that this is a challenge for all of us. Think of all the situations you can where there could be a conflict between equality rights on one hand and freedom of religion on the other. If your response to every one of those is to say that freedom of religion should always win, or if your response to every one of those is to say that equality rights should win, you are flinging the constitutional underpinnings of this country to the winds. There is no hierarchy of charter rights. Um, we need to challenge ourselves, I would suggest, to be ensure that we don't simply see the charter as upholding those rights and freedoms that, that support the views we most agree with. So if we accept that there's no hierarchy of rights, and that must be the starting point for legal analysis in Canada today, then when a law society is faced with deciding whether or not to accept graduates from TWU's proposed law school, or a court is reviewing such a decision of a law, of a law society, the law society cannot start from the presumption that one right or the other should necessarily prevail. In other words, there cannot be an assumption that one right, as opposed to the other, is always going to be more aligned with the public good. And so this came out thoroughly in the decision of Justice Campbell. Throughout the decision, he reminded the reader that, quote, rights and freedoms are not absolute, that protecting pluralism involves a certain amount of messiness, and that living in a multicultural society means learning to live with, although not necessarily condone, a range of beliefs and practices that do not cohere with one's own views or with the dominant moral consensus. And in keeping with that repeated statement that we've had from the Supreme Court of Canada, that there is no hierarchy of constitutional rights, uh, Justice Campbell reiterated that the state cannot give one right a presumptive priority over the other. But that's not part of being the pluralistic and multicultural state that we are. He went on to say that considerable, considerable progress has been made on issues of gay and lesbian rights, and clearly he saw that as a good thing, but that does not mean that equality rights have, quote, jumped the queue to now trump religious freedom. So, if there is no hierarchy, we must have principled ways of deciding when should this right be seen as tipping the balance and when should this right be seen as tipping the balance. We need to principled ways of deciding which right should trump in a particular context. Well, we have been told by the courts that the benefits of protecting one right must be weighed against the harms of restricting the other right. And I would suggest that in today's world, in Canada, for many of us it may be quite easy to see the benefit of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society's position. It is, as described by Justice Campbell, a symbolic statement of solidarity with the LGBTQ community. But I would also suggest that we need to have more robust understandings of the harms and benefits that relate to charter rights that don't fit as comfortably with prevailing social norms. But don't get me wrong, I am delighted that equality is more and more coming to be seen as a prevailing social norm. Yay. However, what I'm saying is we cannot use the Charter to only uphold those rights that fit with prevailing social norms. 
Um, and I would suggest that in today's world, it is those who are making freedom of religious cla religion claims who are likely to be making the non-normative, the countercultural claims. And I suggest to you harm. If we're trying to say, well, what's the harm of, of doing this? Like, what would be the harm of telling TWU they should just take that section out of their covenant? It's not that big of a harm. Well, harm cannot be viewed simply from the dominant perspective, as that will necessarily privilege the dominant perspective which is surely not the point behind having uh, entrenched protections. The whole point of entrenched rights is to provide some sort of protection from the state. If, you, if you're part of the prevailing dominant group, you probably don't need protection from the state. You can vote your party in. You can get what you want. It's when you're in the minority position, and sometimes the unpopular minority position, that that's when entrenched rights actually have some clout. So I would say that in order to do fair balancing, decision makers need to be attentive to the harm that's actually done when the state encroaches on religious freedom and equally need to be attentive to the societal benefits of protecting freedom of religion. And this can be difficult because for at least many of us it may require imagining ourselves into a worldview that is utterly different than how we actually feel about things. So let me take a slightly different example. It uh, doesn't have to do with conf conflicting rights so much, but it, it's asking you to imagine yourself for a moment into a religious worldview, which I'm guessing many of you in this room don't share. And I want to talk about the Jehovah's Witness blood product cases, where a Jehovah's Witness parent says, I know my child may die without that treatment, but as part of my religious belief, that we cannot take blood products, therefore my child can't have the treatment. And the courts have said, and this is assuming a small child here, not old, old enough to, argue, to decide for themselves, the courts have said, so sorry, but we'll be taking the child into our care for a short time and ensuring that they have the treatment. I'm not saying those cases should be decided differently. I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying that I would like the courts in those sorts of situations to pay more attention to what they're actually doing and to acknowledge more openly the harm that they're actually doing. They're doing that harm to their parents' religious faith in order to protect the child, and I, I very much support that balancing in that situation, but I would like the courts to acknowledge the harm that they're doing. And so it seems to me that it's, it's, it's easy for us to imagine why a, a children's aid society or why a hospital steps in and says, oh my soul, we can't let this child die because the parents are going to re re refuse medical treatment. But are we also willing to take the step of imagining, not condoning, not agreeing with, but imagining it from the position of the parent who presumably believes that by allowing their child to have this medical treatment, they have consigned their child to everlasting damnation. That's a big thing for a parent to deal with. And I would at least like the court to recognize that that's a big thing for the parent to have to deal with. Albeit then going on and setting the parent's rights aside, but doing it, I would think, respectfully. Um, so what I'm trying to argue here is that we have to be able to picture what freedom of religion means from the perspective of someone who may hold very different beliefs than we do. Okay? And so just as we have to be able to picture the harm that is experienced by someone whose faith is restricted by the state, we also have to, I think, take very, very seriously the societal benefits of giving a robust understanding to freedom of religion, giving freedom of religion a large and liberal interpretation. And again, if we move from the individual to the society, I think many of us can envision, can very easily envision, the societal, the collective benefits of upholding equality rights. And those benefits are huge. But I'd say that for many people in a secular society, the collective benefits of upholding freedom of religion are hard to grasp. And when the particular religious faith is seen as illiberal, it's even harder to grasp. 
And so my argument here is it's significant, although of course not absolute, no right is absolute in our charter, freedom of religion is not absolute, um, that freedom of religion protects society, uh, there's a societal good in protecting freedom of religion that is separate and apart from the content of the particular religious belief. And I say this for at least four reasons. First, I completely acknowledge that a state cannot function without some degree of allegiance from its citizens. But a state that demands complete allegiance from its citizens and brooks no dissent quickly runs the danger of becoming totalitarian and repressive. Therefore, belief systems that allow individuals to confront the authority of the state can play a role in moderating that authority. Now, of course, those belief systems need not be religious. They could be um, based on conscience other than religion, but frequently they are. And thus, it has been argued that uh, thanks to its ability to act as a counterweight to the power of the state, Religion makes a critical moral and social contribution to society. And in a modern state, religion remains one of the last remaining forces able to fulfill this role, a role so vital to the democratic play of checks and balances. Secondly, I would suggest to you that finding the right way to live together in community is not an easy task, yet that is surely the key concern of government, and I would suggest to you of most religions. Creating room for expression of multiple and different and conflicting understandings of the good admittedly allows for dissension, allows for acrimony, and, let's be up front, allows for the expression of views that may not be helpful at all in and of themselves. But I'm suggesting that allowing that multiple understanding of the good to be expressed is a benefit. It makes it more difficult for the state to try to narrow public debate regarding fundamental issues. Um, so Alvin Esau, a law prof um, at West, uh, has said that we need multiple sources of meaning if genuine pluralism is to be achieved in the face of totali the totalizing forces of the state and popular culture. The third reason for giving significant weight to freedom of religion even if you totally disagree with the belief being stated, is that individuals who feel that society provides some room, and even some fairly respectful room, for living in accordance with their religious dictates, or for speaking up in accordance with their most deeply held views, are, I would suggest, less likely to become disgruntled or hostile citizens. Fourth, do we really trust the state to decide for us which beliefs are harmful and which are simply challenging or dissenting. And even if we trusted the state to get that distinction right, what about the cost of using the power of the state to root out deeply held beliefs, to use state coercion to root out um, deeply held beliefs? Perhaps discussion, perhaps education, perhaps example are better ways of at least looking for common ground and finding respectful ways to live together if we can't find common ground. And I would suggest to you that history tells us that allowing the state to silence minority voices absent very strong reasons to do so has rarely been a wise move. Um, so, I mean, all of that is to say, we've got to weigh the harms and the benefits on either side. Let's be attentive to the harms and benefits relating to freedom of religion that isn't in step with prevailing norms. Going back to the TWU decision in terms of weighing the benefits and harms at stake in that decision, Justice Campbell pointed out that what do we have? He said, on one hand, we have a symbolic statement in solidarity with uh, equality rights. That's hugely important, but it could have been achieved. That statement could be made um, in other ways. Um, on the other hand, you have significant harm 
to, to prospective students' freedom of religion. So, we've said so far, what are the principles that we look to in trying to deal with these sorts of disputes? There's no hierarchy. We try to balance the harms and the benefits. And we're also told, um, oh wait now, skip that one. Uh, we're also told that that weighing of harms and benefits should be based on evidence, not mere speculation. The current dispute with law societies is not the first time that Trinity Western has been involved in litigation involving its community covenant. Some years ago, Trinity Western applied to the British Columbia Council of Teachers for approval of a fifth year in their education program. Up until then, if you wanted to be a teacher, you did four years at Trinity Western, then you trotted off to Simon Fraser to do your fifth year. And they said, we'd like to be able to do our fifth year here, have the whole education degree done at TWU. Uh, the British Columbia Council of Teachers um, focused on the same element of the um, community covenant and said, no, we cannot allow the, you to have the full education degree. It would not be in the public good. Um, the Trinity Western went to court, went all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada, and Trinity Western was successful. The majority of the Supreme Court of Canada was not willing to accept without evidence, and there was no evidence being put forward on this, was not willing to accept without evidence that teachers who received their education degree from Trinity Western were more likely than other students to treat the kids in the classroom in homophobic ways. Similarly, said the court, if four years at Trinity Western really would taint you to that, one, to that degree, would one year at Simon Fraser cure you? Probably not. You've got no evidence. You can't ask us to make our decisions based on speculation. And I think it's really important to note what was not being argued in this case, in the Trinity Western case. It's not being argued. I mean, some people have argued these sorts of things in commentary. That's different. I'm talking about what was being argued in the case, what was before the court. It was not being argued that the proposed law school would be unable to teach constitutional law, human rights law, legal ethics. The advisory committee of the Federation of Law Societies had accepted they could teach those effectively, and that wasn't challenged. It was not being argued, I think the lesson about you might need some evidence here had perhaps been taken to heart, it was not being argued that lawyers trained at TWU would be more likely to treat clients or others in a homophobic fashion than would lawyers trained elsewhere. It was not being argued that the Barrister Society, without this resolution, would have no way of, tr of protecting the public against homophobic lawyers. That's not true, of course, they do have it. Discriminatory conduct would clearly contravene the Nova Scotia Barrister Society Code of Professional Conduct, and a lawyer who treated a client in a homophobic fashion could be disciplined. It was not being argued that this resolution of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society would protect the public, if indeed the public needed that protection, against those already in the legal profession who held traditional views of marriage. Presumably there are a few of those. Um, in order to do that, you would have to disbar all lawyers who belong to religious traditions who hold traditional views of marriage. So, very few Catholic lawyers, I would say, after that, perhaps. Instead, the Nova Scotia Barrister Society argued that allowing Trinity Western graduates um, to uh, article in Nova Scotia would be tantamount to condoning discrimination. And that was not accepted by the court. Justice Campbell was not willing to accept the proposition that allowing TWU graduates to article in Nova Scotia would be evidence of Nova Scotia Barrister Society failing to provide a non-discriminatory environment. He said there have already been substantial efforts made to open the profession to members of the LGBT community. Discriminatory conduct would be dealt with under the Code of Professional Conduct. And he said, quote, there is an important difference between the failure to regulate against discrimination in the profession and failure to sanction someone else, somewhere else, i.e. TWU, for legally exercising a religious freedom. The last principle to remember here, uh, when one is going about this case-by-case -case balancing that is required, is that context is important. And particularly, when we're talking about the Charter, which applies to state action, 
it's important to say, are we looking at a state actor? Are we looking at a private actor? Who's involved here? Um, and of course, it's important to remember that Trinity Western was a private and privately funded law school. So Justice Campbell noted in his analysis that TWU is a private university. It's not part of the state. It's not bound by the equality provisions of the charter. He went on to say, well, many may see the community covenant as offensive. It's not unlawful. And individuals in Canada have the right to attend a private university which requires students to adhere to a code of conduct based on religious belief. Arguments have been made, I mean, just some general commentary, that because TWU, like other universities, is created by statute, that somehow makes it public. That somehow makes it part of the state. Well, the United Church of Canada is created by statute, and I would argue mightily that the United Church of Canada is not a state functionary. Nor does one become a state official simply by joining a, a self-regulating profession. So I would take, I take a very different issue, on a different perspective on how these rights should be balanced when we look at the issue of marriage commissioners wanting to opt out of doing marriages on religious grounds. In that case, I say you're taking on a state function. You abide by the state definition of religion. Here, we're talking about people exercising their right to go to a private university, and that private university is not bound by the charter. The Nova Scotia Barrister Society, however, is bound by the charter. And therefore, in doing the balancing here, had to take reasonable account of the freedom of religion, rights of prospective students. Um, so, with, with those, I leave you with, with those principles and simply say that uh, this is all about trying to find a principled way to resolve conflicts between constitutionally entrenched rights. And surely we want to avoid resolutions that rely, that are just utterly idiosyncratic, that rely um, on the personal views of the decision maker, and presumably we also want to avoid decisions that automatically elevate one charter right or freedom over another. Instead, when there truly is a conflict between two rights or freedoms protected by the charter, such as freedom of religion and equality rights, then the a uh, decision maker must do a careful case-by-case -case balancing. Those scales start out even, and you've got to look at the context and the evidence and the harms and the benefits in each case to decide whether in that particular case this is the right that should trump or this is the right that should trump. And if we genuinely do this balancing, there should be times when the scale tips in favor of equality rights, and there should be times when the scale tips in favor of freedom of religion. And my argument has been that the TWU case falls squarely in the second category. So I'll stop there. I would welcome any comments on this. But also, as I said, uh, law and religion is a hugely broad topic. I am happy to chat with you about any aspect of freedom of religion in Canada today. So thank you very much. Questions, comments, what would people like to tell me about, ask me about, disagree with me on? Yes. Well, first of all, let me commend you on the presentation and the clarity. Well, thank you. Which you presented a very important matter in the life of the country. Um, I'm just, I, would, I couldn't help thinking in the light of certain, I've got to be careful here, I'm not a lawyer. But uh, um, I, I actually talked to the dean years ago, and I decided I didn't want to come to. Probably a wise decision. So my students oh. write this down. Oh, I probably wish you'd done the same. I must say, this is a terrible thing to say in one sense. I, I, I just wish the members of the Supreme Court of Canada could have heard your lecture today. Oh, they, they came up with the principles. <laughs> no, no, and, 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 I've, and I've got to give an account of this to my wife when I go home tonight. So in the interest of domestic balancing and for tranquility, would it be safe for me to summarize your point by saying, in the mixed 
in the context of your talk that what we see in effect is a contest, a debate between Viscount Sankey, who urged us in the person's case of 1929, which you know better than I do, which lay dormant until 1982 when the Charter, he urged Canadian judges to interpret the Constitution of Canada liberally. He did say nothing about balancing. <laughs> and secondly, if I could say that, the Supreme Court of Canada today has explicitly in the LeBay decision reached into a source, extrajudicial source, that is to say, Mr. John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty and introduced into the criminal code the concept of harm. So would it be safe to say that what you're, what you're talking about is a Canadian judiciary that is locked in a debate between Sankey and John Stuart Mill? <laughs> <laughs> first of all, i got to say... Short I, question. I, first of all, i got to say I'm impressed. I'm married to another lawyer, and we don't talk about Viscount Sankey at the <laughs> supper table. So I'm impressed. Um, I think what we do see here, um, and I don't know, there's an interesting Viscount Sankey and John Stuart Mill I hadn't thought about particularly in that way, but I think what we are seeing here is real debate on really important issues about how do we interpret the Constitution. How do we deal with the fact that um, the provisions within the Charter themselves will at times come in conflict? And so, yes, what is going on here is very much a striving toward with zigs and zags and difficult moments and so on, but a striving toward finding um, an interpretation of the entrenched Charter rights that will reflect our secular, our democratic, our multi-faith, our... our um, pluralistic our uh, society, which is, uh, this is also very tied up with, of course, freedom of expression, too. So, yeah. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Simon. Um, I really did enjoy Justice Campbell's decision. I think it is very well written. And uh, as well, I think everyone should read footnote 15. It's great. <laughs> uh, I'll do that this evening. I'll just <laughs> check back on footnote 15. Really yeah. um, <laughs> that's it. I think there's, uh, with it, Bear with me, this could be a bit long, but I think there's one argument that I don't think Justice Campbell uh, entirely succeeds in, in fully addressing, and I'd like to uh, kind of ask you for your sure. opinion on it. So there's a point where he talks about the numbers. There's this argument that came up in the, uh, the NSBS's decision on this issue uh, and in the litigation itself about uh, the question of kind of chairs in Canada. There's a rather small handful of law schools in Canada. There's, that means, therefore, every year, a relatively small number of seats available for people who are going to be entering the profession. Mm. And there is this issue that if you have this discriminatory school, even if it's just one, a certain number of people are going to be excluded from a certain number of seats, which lowers the certain amount of people that are going to be able to enter the profession. Uh, in his decision, Justice Campbell does talk about this. And he says, yes, this is somewhat a relatively important argument. We have to confront it. But then he does this thing where he does look at the numbers and he suggests, well, it's so small that we don't think it's going to be sufficient to really be an issue here. Or the NSBS, though it may have a point, is not really uh, going to succeed in addressing this issue because the numbers are so low. But shouldn't the fact that the argument still stands, even if it were one student that were denied, it would still stand? And he talks about it in that case, something like three a year or something like that. But even if it were one, and think about, like, if there were once school student at Trinity Western who, say, midway through their degree, uh, came out as gay, was kicked outside the school, they would have, a, arguably, probably, a charter case against the school uh, that would go to the Supreme Court that way. So shouldn't, I mean, the fact that he addresses numbers that way suggest that we're no longer in the territory, or we're no longer so comfortably in the territory of absolute rights in one case or another, but that there's this sort of uh, more uncomfortable uh, privileging going on there. So I'll come back to your numbers question in a second. I know that that is the heart of your question, um, and I will certainly address that, but I do want to just say uh, a, a couple other things. First of all, just to be really accurate, simply coming out as gay would not get you kicked out. Engaging in sexual intimacy outside the marriage, outside the, a marriage between a man and a woman could get you kicked out. Um, so I think it's, you know, we need to be fairly clear about what, what, what is at stake here. Um, 
So that was the first thing. Oh, and then the second thing you said, if a student were uh, required to leave because they had violated that section of the covenant, so it easily could be uh, somebody engaging in same-sex relations, it could be somebody engaging in opposite-sex relations outside of marriage. Uh, but let's say we have a gay or lesbian student who um, violates that section of the covenant uh, and is asked to leave. I, I don't think you could have a charter challenge. The school is not a state entity. The school is not subject to the charter. You can find all kinds of public outcry and, 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 and you know, public pressure is, is a great thing to try, try and uh, see if people can ch change their views. But I don't see how you'd have a charter challenge. But coming back to your question um, on the numbers, that argument about, well, you know, it's a fairly small school, so the number of students who will not feel comfortable going there because they can't sign on to that covenant is fairly small and we don't need to worry about it. And you're saying, surely that's a problem even if it's one student. I guess I'd go the other way and say, I wouldn't hang my hat on the smallness. If there is a right in Canada for, and we can debate whether this should be a right or not, but at the current moment, there is a right in Canada to set up a private law school. And if it is able to teach what it needs to teach, and the Federation of Societies, Law Societies says it has, um, then, the, then I think, as I said before, don't, let's not mask this. Let's meet that really uncomfortable truth head on and say yes. It, it, it is, um, from my theological stance, problematic that you have a, a theologically problematic, uh, that you have a school that takes that stance. But I don't see that as saying that is a reason for trying to use the law to shut them down. It, th there, there are hard, hard things on either side. And in this case, I say that's one of the hard things we live with. Yeah. Mark. I'm just wondering, uh, did you say the uh, barristers, societies, and all across the countries are subject to the challenge? And freely the rest of them isn't? So, so in the, uh, uh, the society in making this kind of a decision is using its statutory power given to it under legislation and the Supreme Court of Canada has said that when uh, a body does that, uses its statutory authority to make a decision, it must act in most cases reasonably, sometimes the test is correctness, but usually reasonably and when a charter right is at stake, the test will be whether or not the border tribunal or in this case barrister society took reasonable account of the charter right. Yeah. So my follow up question then is, uh, does that, in your opinion, do you think that because of that, there was pressure on, say, the various societies to want to, um, uh, to want to vote uh, the way they did? Because I would imagine that not every single member of the barrister society supported the, outcome, the final decision, there must have been some members who thought, you know, should be the West should be accredited, so. Mm. Um, it, it was, I wasn't at the meeting, but I gather that it was quite contentious, that people spoke very strongly on both sides of the issue. I think there were far more people there uh, speaking in favor of the position that the Barrister Society ultimately took, but there are certainly voices there um, saying, whether for freedom of religion or in some cases freedom of expression reasons, because the two really, really do cross over in this situation. Uh, the Nova Scotia Barristers Society should not block TWU grads. It was highly contested. Most vo the, the Barrister Society, uh, my understanding, and anybody, and I know there's people in the room who are there, can disagree with me. My understanding is that more of the voices spoke in favor of what the Barrister Society ultimately ended up doing. Of the voices in that room, now that wasn't the poll of all members of the public, that wasn't a poll of all members of um, the Barrister Society. Yeah. Yes? You mentioned uh, in passing <coughs> the word context. And I think if you look at this whole thing, um, one of the things that was missing from day one was context. You know, this is a whole document. It's not just one sentence. And it's a community covenant. It's not a contract. If you start reading through the document, you find that you don't have to believe anything to be able to sign a covenant. 
You're absolutely right that it doesn't require, require a profession of faith in any way. Uh, it simply says we will, as a community and as individuals, we will try to act in these ways and we will try um, not, we will not, we'll try not to, we won't act in these ways. I think it is interesting and worthwhile reading the covenant as a whole. I think there's probably parts of it that almost all of us could like it, like compassion and, you know, well, all that good stuff. Like, we probably all like that. You, you can't take, you can't take one little word out of it. You can't well, I, take I, one I, sentence. And also, the sentence that everybody gets zeroed in on is a covenant opposed to pre-marital sex mm. for everybody. Right, but I guess here's, it has nothing yeah. to do with sexual orientation. It has to do, and, and then you have to go back into what church this is. They obviously, and they say it right out of the they believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible. So you're into what does the Bible say? So the issue, if you look at it in context, is way beyond one, one little sentence. And the one little sentence does not discriminate against anybody except the student who wants to go there and is willing to say that they will forego premarital sex. I guess and the oh, prohibition sorry. against premarital sex is held by a fair number of different religious bodies. And it is rooted, in fact, in the Bible. And the final thing is that, in fact, premarital sex for a group of young people who are going to any university in the country it's unenforceable to stop. It doesn't carry over after you leave. So it's a tempest in a teapot. Well, I guess I would say a number of things. First of all, I do agree that people should read the covenant as a whole. There are, as I said, as I said, I think there's some things in there that we might all think sort of sound good. There's some things that are very clearly religious, and so those who are secular might say, "Well, that's not the way I would go about it," but I'm fine with that. And then there is this section. So I would absolutely say people should read it in um, the whole context. On the other hand, I guess I do think that there is something particularly, um, it's not just a section that we can slip over and not pay much attention to. You're absolutely correct that what it does, starting out, is say no sex, no premarital sex. The difference is, if I'm a student at TWU, or a faculty member, because faculty members sign on to this too, and I want to engage in sexual intimacy, because I'm straight, I have the option of marrying. If you're gay or lesbian, you don't have the option, even though the country, I get to have, I get, even though the country, even though the government allows it, you don't have the option because they say the sacredness of marriage between one man and one woman. So I actually do think that it has a very differential impact for gay and lesbian students. It's not the teaching of the yeah. law school. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I'd just say I think it does have a very differential impact. I think it's an impact that I profoundly disagree with uh, from a theological basis. I do acknowledge that there are many, many church folk who hold that position. And I would say, and I'm here saying we, we can't and we shouldn't preclude them from being part of the legal profession, even though I disagree with them on that theological point. Um, but I, you know, I, certain, I, I would give significance to it. Um, but uh, I do say, also do read the whole thing. Kevin, you were going to say something? Well, I, had, I actually had a question, but also just in, in response to that last yeah. one, I think some of the context behind that covenant as well, like if you look to other institutions that have that covenant. There's a long history of uh, institution, educational institutions in the US that have provisions like that who use it to target gay and lesbian students for their sexual activity and who don't not the same history of targeting uh, straight students for their sexual activity. Um, it's one thing to say that it applies the same on the face of it, but uh, it's Possible, it, it can be unenforceable against straight students because it's possible for straight students to engage in sexual activity in a way that goes under the radar, in a way that isn't necessarily for gay students, especially gay students who choose to come out of the closet during their, which, which tend to be the students who are targeted in the American universities that have similar provisions. So I, I can't agree with the, with the idea that the clause 
isn't in and of itself discriminatory. I do agree that it's a kind of discrimination that they ought to be entitled to do within the context of their own religious institution, but I, but I don't think we can trump it up as non-discriminatory just because on the face of it, it reads a certain way. And, and I think if all you had was the first phrase of not, if, if all it said was not engage in sexual intimacy except within the, the sacred confines of marriage or something, then assuming that you had sort of uh, equal enforcement, which I know is another issue, you could say that that wasn't discriminatory. But as far as I can see, as soon as you say, except within the sacred bounds of a marriage between a man and a woman, it does set up a very strong distinction between same-sex relationships and opposite-sex relationships. But I think you had a question too, Kevin, did you? Okay. Um, the, the charter protects religion in two different sections, and I, I just wonder if um, if that affects how we think about this mm, this analysis. Mm -hmm. Because there's there's freedom of religion up front as kind of a very, as a, a liberty right, mm -hmm. but then within the equality right as well, yeah. there's a right against discrimination on the yeah. basis of religion. And I think it's possible to look at this. It, we, we, talked about it as a freedom of religion case, it's possible to look at TWU as a religious discrimination case. I mean, mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. presumably is a future graduating class mm -hmm. of evangelical Christians who are being denied the right yeah. to enter. And that's a, a bit sort of more clear on the face of it, discrimination against a, an yeah. individual. It doesn't seem to be how we've thought Phrase, about conflict. Framed it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I, I just, and maybe that's because the two at a constitutional level sort of blend into each other, but I wonder if, if if that makes a difference to how we think about the, the conflict here. I don't think it would necessarily, and I don't think you're suggesting it would, but I don't think it would necessarily make a difference as to outcome, but I do think it, it well, and, and you're right, I didn't, even, didn't mention it, I focused only on 2A, but section 15, if you remember when I had section 15 up here, religion, just like sexual orientation, is one of the protected grounds uh, under section 15, and so you're absolutely right that another way of thinking about this is when the state, um, or when a state created decision making body like the barrister society refuses to allow somebody to um, to practice or to article because of an expression of their religious faith you know the, the implication seems to be you can believe this but don't just state it openly I mean that also brings in as I said earlier huge freedom of expression issues right but the, yes, that it is, um, it would be state discrimination against that individual on the basis of, of religion. I'm, I, I agree completely. Yeah. Yeah, Bart. I wonder if the Social Society motion, I think, shot itself in the foot from the get go because it acknowledges that they, they believe that anybody from Purdue Western University would be, would be qualified to enter the law profession. <coughs> they just believe the comment yeah. is discriminatory. I, I, like, I think yeah. they're, because they've already acknowledged them as being. Completely competent, yeah. kind of shoots themselves in the, in the foot. Um, do you think that sans that language, like without that language, there could be arguments to be made that a recognition that uh, a legal training in a microcosm that does not involve uh, voices that aren't evangelical Christians, especially as instructors, there, there may have been arguments around there to say that maybe they won't be as competent as someone that would even allow access to instructors. Mm -hmm and fellow students that come from different backgrounds? So um, that in fact, the Trinity Western is not as capable of producing students well trained in human rights, inequality rights, and so on. I, again, I come back to you need evidence on that. You cannot, I don't see any way how you can just make prospective claims, speculative claims. If it's up and it's running, and you see how those courses are being taught, and you see what's being taught in them, and so on, fine. Then maybe you'll have some evidence, but the idea that you just sort of damn a school without any evidence, when in fact, it's not as though they woke up one morning and said a law school would be fun, and said to the Federation, a law school would be fun, and the Federation said that would be lovely. There's years of uh, debate and discussion and study and renowned, you know, uh, lawyers and legal academics looking at these issues and looking at what's proposed to be taught and so on. That's not to say the Federation could never be wrong, but it's not like a lot of, this isn't just somebody, you know, kind of heads or tails, I wonder if they can teach stuff properly, right? So I think, you know, if you're going to actually make, which is a very large claim, that, um, that human rights and so on can't be taught properly in that context, you got to wait till the evidence is there for it. Yeah. 
Rich. The one also just needs to be made the same, the same, that there's nothing that would prevent the same professor who would be teaching at Trinity Western Law School from going to another school and getting accreditation without any of the further assessment that the Trinity Law School has already been put under. So yeah. really some preventative measure, measure as to like the training just as to whether or not we can so if we're going to say that the teacher at TWU, unless we think there's something magical about the signing of that covenant, if we're going to say that the teacher at TWU cannot effectively teach human rights and equality rights, are we saying that no evangelical Christian can be a law prof? Are we saying that no Christian can be a law prof? And I will say there's been some argument to that effect, in some, not in the, in the court, but to that commentary. Some suggestion that if you are a person of faith, that you will have a greater allegiance to God than to the law, and that therefore you are incapable as a person of faith of teaching the law. And I kind of think, you know, I think I've done an okay job at that for the last 20 odd years. I don't think it's impeded me, right? I'm not evangelical, but you know, where do we draw the line? Where do we draw the line and who is not going to be allowed to teach law? Who is not going to be allowed to talk about these important issues in the classroom? And, and, and you're absolutely right. Do we just say it's only because you're stupid enough to go to TWU and sign on that covenant that you're banned for, for, from doing this anywhere else? Or are we really going to have some sort of McCarthy witch hunt to see whose religious views are sufficiently mainstream that they're going to be allowed to teach, teach in the law school? I mean, you're not going to be able to get up and say, you know, there's no such thing as Section 15 or something. <laughs> You're going to have to teach the law as it is. And so again, I think that it's very important to think, what are we really arguing here? What are we really trying to ban here? And, and is that the kind of society that we want to create? Yeah. One question here and then one at the back. I'm just um, confused a little bit about the Barrister Association's argument. Like they're, so what they're doing, I guess it's more of what they, their, their action of the action is. So they want to, it's basically a boycott to improve the society because they think it'd be better if you had lawyers that didn't go to school with this kind of covenants. And, is that and, it? And I think, I think an effort to pressure the law, the, the Trinity Western to change their covenant, right? To sort of say, if you know there's a bunch of, of, of provinces across um, Canada where your students can't article. I mean, I think PEI has said you can go there, but you know, PEI is pretty tiny. Um, if there's a bunch of provinces across Canada where your students are not going to be allowed, maybe that'll pressure you to change, to change the covenant. And so, you know, so one of the arguments that was going on was to say, if we see a, a, a policy of the university as discriminatory, then we can declare that a student from there doesn't have a real law degree. And Justice Campbell in his decision kind of picks up on that and goes, really? So if you had a law school that raised its tuition high enough that you felt that was discriminatory and barred access to poorer students, like say Dalhousie, raised its tuition <laughs> to the point where it wasn't easily accessed by poor students. <laughs> According to the Nova Scotia Barrister Society, it would have the authority to wake up the day after the tuition hike and go, no, a degree from law, a law degree from Dal doesn't count anymore. So that was the argument, yeah, right? I, I just yeah. don't understand why, like, <clears throat> in that case, they, like, why invoke the charter because it's not, it's not really a question of legality, like, because if it was, you know, school wouldn't be allowed to do what they do. It's a question, you know what I mean? Um, sorry, so what, why did who invoke the charter? The, the Barrister Society or the They invoke the charter in, in their arguments as to why they think that it would be good to give those people licenses. I mean, it's very much grounded in equality rights, but both, I think, both human rights and, and sort of charter concepts of, of equality. Yeah. So. Okay, it's just, it would, it would seem that like you would only invoke the charter if it was a case of like, whether they were doing something illegal or not, which isn't the issue, because if they were, that would be dealt already by mm. the courts in Canada and not. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Or? Well, I, I, th I think that, that the position was we're actually upholding um, those kinds of values that are enshrined both in human rights legislation. I didn't talk about human rights legislation because I only have so much time, but in, in, enshrined in human rights legislation and in the equality, equality provisions of the Charter. So like we're doing a good thing. But so they're, they're implying that the, 
the justice system at large is not doing what they should do, which is shut down the school? Or well, uh, as I said, I, I, I think that there, there really was trying to pressure the law school. Uh, and also, I mean, certainly, in the, and here I'm sort of reflecting on what Justice Campbell had to say. I wasn't there to hear the arguments, although some people in this room were. Um, that what they were, in effect, trying to do was apply the charter to a body to say, oh, bad TWU, you're not living up to the charter. Well, TWU doesn't have to live up to the charter. The charter you know, TWU is not the state. So maybe trying to take an expansive view of, of the application of the charter. That's what I was wondering yeah. what you were doing with it. Yeah. So you had a question, and then you had a question, and then we'll come over to you, David. Yes? This is built somewhat off the past few questions, but do you think this is the end of the road? Like, in the interest of looking at this from both sides, do you read Justice Kennedy's decision and go, OK, it's a little weak there, it's a little weak there, it's really weak there. Yeah. Because so far, I mean, I'm getting the impression that a lot of strong points. But are there negative ones? Do you think it's worth Feeling, or, or is this sort of the nail in the coffin? I absolutely think that Justice Campbell came to the right conclusion. I think he applied the correct principles of law and he applied them correctly. However, the fact that Diana Ginn thinks that Justice Campbell came to the right opinion is fairly irrelevant as to the question as to whether this is the end of the road. Probably not. I mean, um, TWU, I, I assume, is going to challenge in the other jurisdictions that have taken the same stance as the Nova Scotia Barrister Society. The Nova Scotia Barrister Society, you know, can, can decide about appealing. Um, and, the, and just thinking about the different provinces, the, the interesting thing here is that when a Barrister Society <coughs> makes a decision, if that's challenged in the court, the question that the court has to ask itself is not, did the Barrister Society make the correct choice? It has to say, did the Barrister Society make the reasonable choice? And I suppose there is a possibility, not a, not a happy thought, but we could have a patchwork. We could have a patchwork across Canada where, you know, um, one province says, um, you. The, uh, you, you can come in an article, and then that's challenged from an equality point of view, and that's found to be un, un, unreasonable. I mean, I don't think this is going to happen, but because the test is reasonableness, not correctness, there's the possibility of having a bit of a patchwork of, of, of um, decisions across the country. I, um, I think it's reasonable is very much on the side that, that uh, Justice Campbell took, but whether this is the last word in the subject, I rather doubt it, but I don't know. Yeah, last word, and it's not going to be the last word in terms of debate. I mean, in terms of in court cases. Yes, you had a question. Oh, to become a lawyer, a person needs an undergraduate degree, and they have to write and pass the bar exams. And when you're defending someone, I could be defending a prostitute and not agree with the prosecution, but I have to put my own moral, ethic, and opinions uh, under the rug and defend that person by the love and spirit of the law. And just on another note, there was a well-known um, Roman Catholic lawyer who actually defended the market topic in the abortion mm -hmm. um, problem over 27 years ago. And, and, and I think what you come back to there is the idea that as professionals, we are bound by a professional code of conduct um, and should be disciplined if we don't live up to it. And uh, so certainly um, <coughs> homophobic behavior of a lawyer toward a client should be disciplined. I'm a big fan of that idea. Uh, but, but I think what you're saying is we cannot make the assumption that because someone holds a particular religious view about marriage, they will treat their client or anybody else in a homophobic fashion. And that was the kind of evidence that the Supreme Court of Canada said would, they wanted in the earlier TWU litigation and wasn't provided. Yeah. Society's statement, like they haven't broken down. They actually mention um, they accept man, a man and a woman in any type of background um, walk of life. So the thing is, whether I'm a TW graduate or not, that really shouldn't matter. And I guess it comes down to saying, is it in the public interest to say that students who have graduated from TWU cannot practice law. 
and I would say no, it's not in the public interest. Yeah. David, you had a question. Okay. Yes. I noticed that um, you said earlier in your in the lecture that uh, other universities in the U.S. had similar uh, covenants. Why is it that in Canada this gained so much traction? Is it because in the U.S. there isn't the same right to protecting <coughs> LGBTQ students, or is there other reasons? Um, one of the reasons, and there may be many, and I don't know, and I don't know how much. Um, I actually haven't followed what's happening in the States, so I don't even know how much outcry or lack thereof. It may just simply be history. Right? You set up a, you know, if you set up a, a, a law school 50 years ago and had a covenant like this, well, probably nobody, almost nobody batted an eye because we've moved so dramatically from what our, our dominant norms are. But you used to try to set up a, a, a law school like that in this day and age, and boy oh boy, people will notice. So I think that's a significant aspect too. Oh, yes. I'm American. If I can just like yeah, jump right in. Of, like how it is. So um, as far as I understand, like Canada doesn't have a lot of private universities at all, let alone religious ones. Um, yeah, that's correct. And they're they're way more common in the states. I mean, I know lots of people go to private universities. There are secular private universities and religious ones. Um, a good example that like I can think of right now um, doesn't necessarily like a lot of this is kind of like the LGBT stuff. So basically, Liberty University is a huge university in Virginia where I'm from. They're private um, and they're Christian, um, and they had like a like a Democratic Students Society or something or de sorry Democrat not Democratic like the political party, uh, and they were told that they couldn't, like I guess when it started out, the school allowed them to like be a club and like function under the school, but then they told them later on that they couldn't because that was when the Democratic Party started um, like advocating for same-sex marriage to be legalized, and so then the school told that they wouldn't be allowed, like they could, they could, they could stop the kids from meeting, but like they could, they could not stop like allowing them to be an official school club. So like that's an example of like, what happened. Um, but since we have so many private universities in this, it's like it's super common. I think that's why because you guys don't have a lot, so when it does yeah, happen, it's a, a very different history, yeah. and very different timing, and so on. Yeah, thank you. I, we're, I think we're almost done. But Elizabeth, I have about two of the quickest comments because I saw two last hands. I think Aaron, you had your hand up. Yeah, you talked about how a lot of the charter doesn't apply to Western mm. universities. What about the British Columbia Human Rights Act, though, and that? If someone's effectively being denied from entering that university, are you discriminating in the provision of some sort of service? Um, well, there's a couple of answers to that. First of all, um, different provinces have different provisions that allow religious or religious based organizations to have some protection from the provisions of the Human Rights Act. I'm not sure what the provision is in British Columbia, except that Justice Campbell very emphatically stated in his decision that this was not a violation of, of this had never been found to be in violation of the British Columbia um, Human Rights Act. I would suggest though even in those provinces that don't have particularly fulsome exemptions for religious organizations you might still be able to make an argument that this is not a violation of the Human Rights Act. I haven't thought this through a whole lot of something I've just been sort of turning my mind to a little bit uh, of late I've been thinking much more about the charter arguments but basically Human rights legislation, which does apply more broadly than the Charter, says that you can't, in various ways, including the provision of services, discriminate against anyone on various grounds, um, including sexual orientation. However, um, you can discriminate on protected grounds, which include race and gender and this and that and everything else, um, if you can show that there's a bona fide, a good faith reason for doing so. And while not absolutely parallel, there is a human rights case in which a Mennonite college was found to be justified in, in firing their payroll clerk when they found out that she was Mormon. <laughs> because they said that it is an important part of the denominational character of that school um, in order to be for that all employees there were part of the spiritual education of the kids, not just the teachers. And therefore, it was a bona fide occupational requirement that all employees of the school be Mennonite. And so it seems to me that some of those same arguments might be made. Um, but I'm not sure. I've spent way less time thinking about the human rights of that sort of tangential, and I, I'll think about that after I finish writing about the charter stuff. 
I think I saw one last comment and very, very quick and then we're going to end. Was it? Okay, okay. Then I'd like to say, I think we are at an end, even five minutes over. So thank you so much, everybody.